So as many of you know, uh, Telfer has been committed to health management uh, for over 50 years when we first uh, founded uh, the MHA program. What might be a little bit less known is that since then we have developed and, and implemented many other health programs, including an MSc in health systems, a health stream in our PhD in management, and a health analytics option in our undergraduate program. At the same time, we've been hiring a significant uh, cohort of professors interested in various aspects of health management, such as me. Um, and that's been from operations research to health policy to health governance and information technology. So I do encourage you all, if you're not uh, familiar with Telfer, to check out our website, take a look at the programs that we have on offer, um, and also to encourage any promising candidates you may know in your organizations to consider our programs in the future. And I also invite you to take a look at some of the profiles of our professors. Um, perhaps there might be a question that you've been um, itching to answer and that might be best explored with a research partnership. Uh, in addition, this year we're going to be hosting several of these NHA conference series webinars as well as a fantastic health research seminar series. So uh, please reach out to us if you'd like to be notified about these events, or if you're already on our list, uh, please keep an eye out for future events. Our tradition at the University of Ottawa before any event is to recite the Indigenous affirmation. So we pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So I'd also like to introduce Lynn Savage, who's our chat moderator today. She'll be sharing our speaker's biographies uh, in detail in the chat, and we'll also be interacting with you. And she's gonna be uh, the one that forwards me your questions since uh, I won't be able to watch the chat at the same time as moderating the panel. So before we start, uh, a few house rules. So as you may have noticed, uh, this panel is conducted in English primarily. However, questions can be sent in English or in French. Uh, the webinar is also going to be recorded and emailed to participants in a few days. We ask that you please remain muted during the webinar, and we also encourage you to keep your camera off. Um, that will allow our panelists to have their cameras take over the screen, which is um, ideal. And we ask that you use our chat feature instead of us uh, speaking up. Uh, if you wanna add any comments, um, the system also allows you to react to others' messages if you want to give someone a thumbs up, for example, and also to submit your questions for the Q&A, which we will have um, for the most of the presentation, but a bit later. So we have some fantastic speakers uh, who have taken a moment uh, to stop saving the world for a second and come talk to us today. So I'd like to introduce them very briefly. We have Dr. Alan Forster, who's the Vice President of Innovation and Quality at the Ottawa Hospital. And I believe I heard something about him playing a, a, a bit of a role in COVID testing um, in Ottawa right now. So um, unfortunately, he'll have to leave us at six o'clock as he has a very urgent work-related uh, situation to handle. So if you have any questions for him, I do ask that you keep that in mind and get those questions in earlier rather than later. Um, but then we also have two other fantastic panelists who will be making up for his absence after six o'clock. And that's Dr. Andrew Falconer, who is the president and CEO of Queensway Carlton Hospital and also an emergency physician. And last but not least, we have Sandra Motilva, uh, who is a midwife and an entrepreneur and going to be providing a fantastic um, different perspective on uh, health for us here today. So the way we're organizing today's event is that um, we will have a, each speaker will have a few minutes to chat 
about their experiences with virtual care. And then this will be followed by a longer Q&A. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Alan Forster uh, to please introduce yourself and share your experiences with virtual care. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thanks Agnes and, and the rest of the committee for inviting me to, to do this. Um, you know, we're in a bit of a, an interesting situation in the world right now and, and, and there's many of us working and, and affected by it. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for people to take the time to participate in this session. Um, my, my role is uh, Vice President for Innovation and, and Quality at the Ottawa Hospital. I, I uh, support a number of our internal programs uh, related to our care delivery mission, one of which is our, our virtual care program uh, and, our, and, our, and our ambulatory care programs. But I also support other areas as well in the organization, as well as our innovation portfolio. Um, I'm, a, I'm an internist by training uh, and have, uh, have done work in, in health services research um, before, before I became a hospital leader. Um, so I'll, I'll switch over to the, the, the area of focus, which is virtual care. Um, you know, I think most people are aware of the impact that uh, the pandemic has had on on virtual care. And I, I'd like to explain a little bit about what what virtual care is for us and why it's so important. And, then, and I'll, I'll shift a little bit then to, uh, what, you know, sort of how things have changed as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I'll, I'll provide a quick overview. I think what I'd like to do is I don't want to say too much because it would be nice for Andrew and Sandra to build on what I'm, I'm saying. Um, and then also there will be lots of times for questions. So for us, uh, virtual care um, and there's different definitions out there for us. Virtual care is it's, it's really a care that occurs when we're trying to meet a patient's needs, when we're working to meet a patient's needs without us being physically present at the patient's bedside or at the patient's uh, with the patient. <clears throat> so really the patient is interacting with technologies and having their, their care needs met. Um, we, we've looked at, at, at how we might design that uh, solution for, for different types of situations. So for example, when you know helping to keep people healthy uh, or helping to prevent disease progression in someone who already has an established disease or helping support people during an acute illness, whether that be to help with a diagnosis or to help support uh, help support them in their own environment instead of coming into the hospital. Um, and then, and then of course, helping them recover from physical illness uh, and, 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 to, um, and to, 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 to proceed through some type of rehabilitation program. So, so broadly speaking, we see that there's lots of different ways for that to happen. Um, but really it comes down to, you know, whether you're using a very generic approach where people are logging on and seeing information or whether there's a very more specific focus on an individual patient and you're providing one-on-one -on -one care to an individual that's tailored and supported to their specific needs. And of course it happens in settings where perhaps uh, it, it may be in a setting where it's instead of in a hospital or in a clinic, that the person's in their own home uh, or in a facility that may be around the world. There's really kind of two modes to virtual care. I would say there's a synchronous mode where we're interacting immediately and then an asynchronous mode where we're actually the person's providing information and then we provide information back at some future date. And, and both of these are supported by technologies in different ways. Some are with, um, you know, things like email and text messaging or, or other secure chat method methods. But then others are, you know, the more, you know, for the synchronous communications, it's, it's video visits and, and telephone visits and, and other, uh, other ways of, 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 of sharing information. So that's what it is. Why do we want it? I think fundamentally we want it because uh, patients need a different experience uh, that needs to be more flexible and, and conducive to their situation, and can support them in their in in, in their own uh, support them in their own environment. Um, and and part of uh, part of this is to make it more convenient, but also there's many other benefits. The other the other part that I think is relevant and worth thinking about is our, our workforce. Our workforce is in short supply in healthcare, and there there has to be better ways to support people, um, given given the shortages of our workforce, uh, and and the need for us to extend ourselves um, beyond uh, beyond our walls. Um, and then I, I think the third thing is really around the funding crisis and challenges that we're having, and, and you know really we can't continue to support people in a, in a, in a situation uh, where we require big bricks and mortar buildings. 
and, and it, especially when there's alternatives that are, are better for the patients and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps, um, uh, you know, perhaps less expensive. So that, that's fundamentally the issue why we're doing this. I, I can say the COVID pandemic has helped us and, and I'll, and, and, and I'll say that there's a lot of different issues with moving this forward. One, one scenario we've had is really around how do we support the, the, the pr practitioners uh, and the staff adopting this change. And I'm sure Andrew will share this message about um, how we've had a, a massive shift when, we, when we've gone. We, this is, uh, virtual care is not something that's new with the pandemic. What, what's new is the, ta the, make up, the take up of it by people. Um, and I think really fundamentally there's, there's two things. I mean, when we talk about change in general, we talk about, you know, how do we help people change? But fundamentally, it comes down to what is the alternative? And, and when we went into the pandemic, the alternative was really not seeing the person at all. And so to create an alternative where, where people could be seen, it, it made it a, a, a big imperative for, for our doctors to, uh, to shift their practice uh, and move to this. And I think that's probably one of the most compelling lessons learned, like when you need to make change happen, it's always about what that burning platform is. Um, there are some other issues that I'm, I'm sure others can bring up in terms of this type of scenario, but maybe what I'll do is I'll leave that for our, our, our my, my colleagues and and um, and we can uh, have obviously a lot of time for questions. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Sandra? Hi, so thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. And uh, so I am an alumni from the Ottawa U, from Telfair, from the Executive MBA program. So I was a midwife for many years previous to that in different areas of uh, the continent. And I also was involved in the global projects for maternal and newborn and uh, pediatric care. So that gave me a global perspective about uh, health, healthcare, especially in, the, in that discipline. And currently I am a PhD candidate in the USA, in, in Chicago, but I am here. Uh, so for the leadership, uh, organizational leadership, so basically leadership uh, studies. And I am areas of my research is about technology in, in healthcare, and I am currently involved in, in a particular project that is about uh, researching the impact of uh, bias in the, um, healthcare algorithms and the impact that they might have in the outcomes. So, um, previous to um, when I was a midwife, um, Virtual care was didn't exist, right? Um, but you know, I am quite involved in the, in different forums, and I consult in healthcare. And uh, I was inspired by the chaos that happened when COVID hit, um, and everybody was st starting to juggle how we can see patients, which kind of platforms are HIPAA. Uh, compliant, how we can do this. So, you know, I am an entrepreneur. So uh, one of my ventures is related to virtual care. So um, Dr. Uh, Alan said uh, about the definition of uh, virtual care, but uh, what I would say is that virtual care is um, an exchange of, uh, of care that happens uh, virtually or remotely with uh, between a healthcare providers and a patient and his or her psych, psych, uh, cycle of care that happened remotely. Basically, this is, is how I would be label it. And um, so Alan says about the advantages, but I think that um, as much as there is all these advantages are things that we need to start uh, thinking about because uh, Virtual care, something happened very quickly, despite the fact that there were lots of conversation previously. But right now, okay, we have the, the the horses out of the barn, so we need to start controlling it. And um, you know, one of the things that happened with innovation in healthcare is that innovation is uh, disruptive, right? Instead, um, is is one of the main forms. So. Um, and I think that it requires a little bit before it becomes entrenched into the community. There are things, there are gaps that we need to 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 cover. 
um, and we can elaborate more about that. So this is about me. Lovely, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And, Andrea, on to you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for uh, attending today. I uh, hope we have a really good discussion after this. You know, uh, about eight months ago, had you told me that uh, we would be doing nasopharyngeal swabs and a drive through at the Canadian Tire Centre over the weekend, or that we have, would set an internal target for 70% of our care to be delivered virtually, I might have suggested that you were delusional, if not overtly psychotic. I may have suggested some pretty strong medications to assist you with this problem, and uh, may have introduced you to some of my friends in the mental health department. But the truth of it is that our reality has really changed. COVID-19 has been very, very disruptive. And as they say, you should never waste a good crisis. This is really our opportunity to think about the way we deliver healthcare and the medical models of care that we deliver it. And virtual care is, is one, such, uh, one such initiative. You know, a few things happened right away in, in the pandemic. Patients were afraid to come to the hospital because they were afraid they'd catch COVID-19 here. Our providers quite honestly didn't know how to safely interact with patients in a one-to-one -one, uh, 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 setting. Um, so there was some reluctance, you know, to have interviews in, pay in physicians' offices and such. And we had a fairly limited uh, supply of protective equipment at the time. And it was, there was really fear that we would run out. Uh, so all of these served as uh, an impetus to, uh, to really look at the way we uh, deliver care and explore every opportunity for delivering care virtually. The uh, few years ago, uh, I worked with a uh, MHA student who did a residency at Queensway Carlton Hospital. We did a, uh, a pretty interesting project where we we're trying to deliver mental health services in family physician offices. We called it collaborative care. The idea was that the psychiatrist would go to the family physician's office, see the patient, and then interact with the healthcare team uh, to, uh, to help with the management of the patient. So the idea was to deliver care to the patient, but also to improve the knowledge of the primary care physicians uh, to help them deal with other, other issues. So I recruited a psychiatrist to the job and uh, the psychiatrist decided uh, they didn't want to do it because, you know, that's basically what they're doing in their own office anyway, and the patient should just come to, uh, to their office to get the, the same care. Uh, so that took about three years. Uh, to uh, both plan and execute and then eventually fail. But as soon as COVID-19 hit, the psychiatrists were amongst the first to start saying, hey, you know what? I think I can deliver care virtually. I think I can get a good assessment uh, of uh, the patient and even get a glimpse into their home living room and such uh, by delivering patient virtual care. So now our psychiatrists are delivering care to uh, uh, patients at their home or in family physician offices. And we're delivering consultative services to uh, uh, Almont Carlton Place and Arm Prior, as well as uh, all of the west of Ottawa. So something that took three years to fail was fixed in about three days uh, because of the change in situation. My, my final example is a, uh, we ran a clinic at the hospital. We called it a soft tissue infection clinic. So folks that have infections usually in one of their limbs and that kind of thing were being seen in the emergency department. And they were having to come back every eight hours for their antibiotics and were being reassessed by emergency physicians who are not quite as qualified as infectious diseases uh, physicians to deliver that care. So we developed a clinic we called the Soft Tissue Infection Clinic. And it was so successful that it was overrun uh, within the first uh, few weeks. So we had people coming and waiting for hours and standing in huge lines. Uh, it basically overran our ambulatory care department, but uh, it was so valued by our patients and our community that we continued with it. So as soon as uh, COVID hit, uh, we had to rethink the way we delivered that care. And now generally there's some sort of in-person assessment done at some point to look at the severity, but going on from that, uh, once it's determined to be appropriate, we deliver the rest of the care virtually. Well, now you can walk through that clinic without bumping into another person. We're able to maintain physical distancing and we're providing you know, a care that's uh, actually creating more patient satisfaction and in fact, better health outcomes for our patients. So those are just a couple of small examples of you know, how we've used virtual care and 
how quickly the change uh, occurred uh, precipitated by COVID. So that concludes my remarks and uh, maybe I'll turn it back to you, Agnes. And yes, thank you. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone that you can post uh, your questions that you have for our panelists into the chat um, and they will make their way to me. Uh, one first question, if I may, this is one of my own. That's the benefit of moderating the panel as I get to sneak in all my questions. Um, all of you are leaders in uh, your organizations and have played a very large role in implementing virtual care. So I'm curious if you can comment on how has how have you been how have you needed to adapt your leadership style and how do you see others lead, other leaders adapting their leadership style in this time of rapid change? Uh, and maybe Andrew will go back to you if you don't mind to start. Sure, that's a really interesting question. So at uh, Queen's Bay Carlton Hospital, we you know, a, a big part of our culture is sort of this notion of collaborative leadership. We uh, fully engage our staff in uh, decisions and uh, um, we, we uh, make our key performance indicators and strategic priorities together and hold ourselves accountable to those. Uh, but when COVID hit, uh, there was really no time for that kind of stuff. And we really had to adopt more of a uh, top-down command and control uh, leadership because decisions had to be made on the spot. And in fact, sometimes directives from the ministry were changing twice a day, you know, early on in this thing. So we really needed to change that uh, fully collaborative leadership style to a uh, to more directive. Um, the challenge has been pulling ourselves back out of that leadership style because it's really important for uh, for our organization and our uh, employees and physicians to be involved in decision making. Uh, so we are working on that, but. Uh, we did have to, have to adapt the leadership style to be a little more uh, top down and command and control, as I said. Thanks. That's a that's a very fascinating point. I didn't even consider that, but I guess that's that's needed when things are changing so quickly. Uh, Alan, did you have the same experience? Yeah, very very similar situation <clears throat> at Ottawa. And and you know similar philosophy. I think if in, in healthcare, that collaborative approach is is definitely a requirement uh, in order to succeed. I have to say, um, you know the 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 need to communicate uh, is accelerated in a is is heightened in a, in a crisis. Um, and so although although some of this is not um, you know where it's not collaborative, the the need for the need for communication, explaining why you're doing things. Uh, providing uh, a forum for people to uh, provide questions or, uh, is very useful um, and helps instill that trust that's required. Um, I, I would say that, uh, in addition to what Andrew Andrew said, that you know there was also a shift. You know there is often this analysis paralysis that tends to take hold. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, should we do something? Which should what type of platform should we use? Uh, when you're up against it and you have to make those decisions quickly, uh, you, you really have to you have to behave differently um, and and make choices that you know perhaps a little faster than you would normally make um, and, and execute uh, usually with uh, tried and true uh, tr tried and true solutions as opposed to perhaps some of the experimentation you might do uh, to find find you know the optimal answer un under normal circumstances. I'll, I'll swing over to you, Sandra, to share your experience with leadership. So I think that uh, when you are dealing with these um, emergency situations, your leadership, you know, if you are more inspirational, if you have a more um, this this kind of you, you have to probably switch very quickly to a more decisive, uh, probably in uh, a more um, autocratic or, um, um, you know, those kind of de decisive. And I think that the one that probably will fit in this particular model is to be uh, a pace setter, right? Because the pace is, is so fast, so you have to move fast and you also have to be uh, bureaucratic as well because you cannot move in something like this without uh, consulting guidelines. Um, 
from the women's women perspective, I think that this is something that I would like to to bring. I think that women have demonstrated globally that they can lead uh, during a crisis like this. Uh, we have uh, we have tremendous, awesome leaders globally that manage the pandemic and even locally uh, that were able as as women to to make. Uh, Difficult decisions, and some of them were about, uh, you know, economic that had an impact in the economy. And uh, so, uh, in terms of women leadership, there are only 18 countries in the world that had women as leaders. So that is only seven percent of the population. So I guess that there are some. Um, researchers at the moment that are probably finding correlation if in these countries in which uh, female leadership uh, were successful with the pandemic if there is other also indicators like microeconomics gdp gini uh, or um, countries in which social distancing is uh, easier to be adopted but um, i think that women also have demonstrated that they can lead decisively uh, during um, emer emergency uh, a crisis and a pandemic like this. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, now to some questions from our chat. Uh, I can't keep asking my questions when we have so many fantastic ones coming in. Um, I can't help but start with a question from our interim dean, Wojtek Michałowski. So he asks, uh, how would you triage what type of care should be delivered virtually and what in person? Uh, Alan, so shall we start with you? Oh, okay, Andrew, go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, thanks. So that's that's a, an excellent question. And, um, you know, there's always a fear of uh, medical error and clinicians are quite reluctant to uh, deliver care where a physical, virtually when a physical examination is required. So there have been studies at looking at when errors occur, and it's generally in conditions like pneumonia or heart failure, where you really do need to actually uh, listen to the chest and examine the patient. So our physicians have been developing fairly strict guidelines about what conditions are appropriate for, um, for uh, virtual care. And in general, um, for example, in our cellulitis clinic, the first visit is in person so they can really get a full assessment of the clinical situation. And then when appropriate, all of the follow-ups are done virtually. Uh, so we've developed some pretty good guidelines about what we consider to be clinically appropriate for virtual care and what really should have that hands-on experience. Great. Yeah, I would Alan? say we're using a simil similar approach. Um, we do have um, a lot of scenarios where we're doing an initial triage uh, discussion and, and and investigation with with the, with it with an AI like a, a telephone or video visit, uh, often to do fact finding uh, and also find some initial pieces of uh, details that we could potentially answer. So when the person arrives for their in-person visit. Uh, it's a more efficient use of the visit and, and the time that they're together. So that would be the only thing that I would add uh, to what uh, Andrew said. Um, the other piece is, of course, I mentioned a couple of things around uh, rehabilitation um, and, uh, and, 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 and I think in that setting, you know, there's a little bit more intensive work required to ensure that uh, the safety in the home is appropriate. Um, uh, and that there is someone there who can help. And I think in, in those circumstances, it may be uh, based on the baseline and the uh, type of activity they need to do for the rehabilitation. Um, I, I think the third area where I would just mention is that we're, we're, we're now experimenting with virtual care for a substitute as acute care. Um, and, you know, we're using virtual care uh, in the hospital, actually. Like most people think it's only for, you know, people when they're at their own home or remotely, but we're we're creating environments in the hospital where people can be, uh, you know, interact with their provider, uh, be monitored kind of remotely. And in that case, you know, where we're looking at is it, it, it's adding an extra layer of safety to a circumstance where people, you know, often are, are, are in a circumstance where they're quite isolated. So 
although there are times when the virtual care can be um, dangerous, there's also many times when it actually enhances the safety of the situation. Sorry, sorry about that. I just had to close the window because there's some noise outside. So um, thank you, Alan. You brought up a, a point that was asked in our uh, registration questions, which was around uh, ensuring that we avoid harm to patients when care is delivered virtually. Um, so uh, Sandra, I was wondering if you had any thoughts around that safety once we are delivering care virtually. So I cannot imagine, um, you know, as a former clinician midwife to do my work uh, without touching a patient, right? I think that it will require some kind of hybrid model in which you can do both or uh, you can also leverage some uh, devices to that can provide uh, assessment uh, for, for the baby and, and for the mother. But I think they have to be a combination of both. And the other, um, the other thing that happened during these pandemics, like uh, 200 million of women around the world couldn't have access to pregnancy care in the way that they, according to the standards, right? So the World Health Organization needed to to promote some kind of uh, guidelines that they were a little bit different in how to do how to do assessments um, virtually using uh, using video call or or, or the telephone. Um, so I I think that it has to be a, some kind of hybrid model. <laughs> you have to include both because you need to touch the patient, and virtual care works really well. Um, for any kind of behavioral uh, interaction. But when you need to perform a procedure, when you need to touch a patient or to do a clinical assessment, I think that it has limitations. Uh, so, you know, it's also about the, the clinician to uh, when to advise uh, to come to the office. So then that brings me to uh, Jim Lambley's question around, um, first, he says thank you to everyone for, for spending time with, with us and your insights. I agree. Thank you. Um, and then he asks uh, to hear more about the buy-in piece to the 70% virtual target. So I guess that's a question for Andrew. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the buy-in piece to the 70% virtual target, especially with moving to phase three in Ontario? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I think one of the things that happened, especially at a community hospital that um, facilitated virtual care, was the uh, OHIP, the uh, the fund, the funder for physicians in a fee-for-service environment, provided billing codes for virtual care. They did that in March, and you know a lot of the um, actual in-person care was driven by the fact that a physician couldn't bill for. Uh, his service, his or her services, unless that interaction occurred. So, so um, the billing code uh, was very helpful early on, um, and the physicians said when we stopped doing elective activity, uh, we really feared that the burden of disease in the community was uh, was getting worse because a lot of patients weren't getting access to, you know, their CAT scans or MRIs or surgical care. Um, so the physicians wanted to do everything that they could uh, to try to provide some level of care to the, pa the patients who weren't able to actually physically come to the hospital. Uh, in addition, the, um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, who are the, uh, the regulatory body for physicians, uh, provided a very supportive document in support of virtual care and uh, really uh, took away the fear that the college would uh, chase after you if you started providing care in another sort of way. Uh, so they were three things that happened at the same time that really helped uh, uh, provide physician buy-in to the process. I'd like to build on that. The other thing that happened um, is that we invested institutional resources to facilitate the shift. Um, there, there, um, you know, we recently implemented, and, and most hospitals will have uh, an, an electronic medical records, and, and a lot of the electronic medical records on the market have capabilities re regarding virtual care, 
so uh, we took took advantage again of the situation and and, and stood up our, our IT team to really move forward on on that platform and make it useful. Um, and and so really, what that involved was building uh, workflows and building um, uh, you know integration with things like uh, with you know for video visits, but integration into the workflow so that it, the clinical notes and the billing processes would all be available to other providers. So when you did the visit, it wouldn't just be information that was in the head of the of the clinician or or in their own record. It was now available across the system. Um, and also to to and I think Sandra made the point earlier about the, the the compliance with privacy. Make sure that that whole that whole infrastructure was safe. Um, and so that that actually helped the clinicians adopt and move. Uh, that came with a lot of training and support, uh, both for the clinician but also for the patient. Uh, and and you know that's an ongoing challenge to help support patients learn how to use this uh, themselves. And oftentimes we need to spend a few minutes at the start of visits to make sure that they're comfortable with the approach and uh, and 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 also also get their consent to uh, to participate in the in the visit that way. Um, I think that uh, it would be interesting. There are lots of surveys done, and um, and um, patients are also they need to to see their clinician. I don't think that the seventy percent could be something that uh, for every patient will work because I think that uh, there is um, over sixty percent of the patients, according to some of the surveys that would like to see their clinician in person. Um, so that depends the, the case and uh, in some disciplines that will not be possible. We know that. Uh, Andrew, did you have any replies to that or did you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah so the 70 percent target, it depends on how you define the denominator. And uh, okay. our <laughs> is, uh, like midwifery where you clearly need to do a, an exam or colonoscopy where or a biopsy, you know, those sort of things. Um, so it's that when clinically appropriate is how we define our denominator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important that um, there are populations of patients where it's not appropriate at all. Um, and it's not to, this is not to replace uh, the in-person visit, it's to, to create an environment where the, you know, there's an opportunity for the alternative. Um, and, uh, but I think a lot of times people were previously saying things were not appropriate. And when, when again, sort of to that point of what depends on what the alternative is, in, in circumstances when there is limited alternatives, uh, you know, it's amazing what, what opportunities you can find and how you can use the technologies to help. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this uh, leads nicely into a question we had um, before the panel uh, from our registrants. How are provincial and international laws and guidelines, as well as licensure, accounted for in a virtual healthcare service delivery? Further, does indemnity insurance cover complaints of a virtual service? I think that's a tough one, and we're supposed to direct the tough ones to Alan. That's what we decided on. <laughs> Can you repeat that again? I, I, when you said the word indemnity, my, my head went in a spiral. <laughs> does indemnity insurance cover complaints of a virtual service? Is the end of that. Yeah, so our, our medical malpractice insurer will cover cover these types of uh, of of, of uh, you know interactions. Um, you know, it seems to be a bit un, untested at this point. Um, you know, virtual care didn't start during the pandemic. It, it has been going on for some time. You know, even telephones telephones are the most common platform for doing virtual care. So, you know, for a long time, patients and doctors have, and, and other healthcare professionals have been interacting by telephone. So, you know, this is not completely new, um, but it, it is covered uh, and would be covered if it was a professional act. I, I would say that it's a bit unclear regarding out of country service. Like if you were providing, let's say, a service to um, to someone in a different country, um, and I'm not sure if, if that's been tested. I, I don't know if Andrew's got an answer on that. I would I would suspect that there may be some challenges and issues with that, but I I, I, I don't know to be to be blunt. So just to build on Alan, so uh, 
healthcare is a provincially, uh, for the vast majority of activities, provincially regulated. So, as I mentioned, the College of Physicians and Surgeons has certainly supported uh, the notion of virtual care uh, when appropriate. And our insurer, the Canadian Medical Protective Association, has also uh, indicated that they will provide uh, um, support for, uh, for any uh, issues that come out of uh, virtual care. And in malpractice claims, um, physicians are held to the reasonable standard as determined by their peers. Uh, so in this time, I think there's a general understanding that virtual care is the only reasonable alternative in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone understands the limitations of virtual care. Um, so I, I, we, there is, I'm not aware of any uh, case law around this yet, but, uh, but uh, I think we're certainly getting the support from our regulator and from our insurer at this point, which I think has provided a lot of comfort to the uh, clinicians. Sandra, did you want to add? Um, I think that, okay, we, we have to follow HIPAA, FIPA, um, COPA, in, I don't know if COPA exists here in, in Canada, but it's for, for children. Uh, these are, you know, framework for, um, uh, for healthcare. Um, however, uh, I would like to add that there is uh, probably no here, but in the States, there is um, a gray area uh, that could be potentially a, a problem, Is the, especially what if some of the virtual care have um, artificial intelligence embedded, and is the aspect of contestability which can create uh, a gray area in terms of liability for the clinician is how good do you know your algorithms and how good do you know what um, they are doing for the patient and this is the, the point that i would like to to add right and this is a gray area and um, there is a, an article that has been published recently in the harvard law magazine uh, that talk talk about this. <laughs> so, yeah. Any comments to add, Alan? Uh, no, nothing. Okay. <laughs> so let's go to another question. Uh, this one's about metrics. So, what metrics? Stephen Parker asks, what metrics are you currently using to assess the effectiveness of virtual care services from the patient or caregiver provider perspective? And uh, second, do you anticipate any changes to these metrics in the near future? And maybe also more broadly, if I may add, Stephen, I hope you don't mind, um, what metrics should we be using and how should metrics change in a virtual system? Um, Alan? Yes. Uh, I, you know, this is a work in. Alan, I'm not able to hear you. I don't know if others are. No. No. So, Alan, um, we seem to have lost you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, but in this situation, I'll, I'll flip it over to Andrew uh, to talk about his organization, if that's okay. And hopefully you'll come back. Man, and you promised to give all the hard questions to Alan, so thanks for trying. <laughs> so, so I we're tried. Still... <laughs> I tried. No, thank you, thank you, Agnes. I appreciate it. Um, the um, and technology saved Alan. So our our first measure is a process measure, and that's percent virtual care delivered. Um, but when you start thinking about how do you measure the effectiveness of virtual care, you need to start thinking about some outcome metrics. Uh, I think they'd be similar to some outcome metrics that we use to evaluate other types of clinical care. I mean, and then also another uh, outcome metric is patient satisfaction. Um, we can already see patient satisfaction is increasing dramatically, but we don't have enough data to really uh, understand uh, the clinical outcome metrics. So that's not as good an answer as Alan would have given you, but uh, that's where we're at at Queensway Carleton so far with this in early days. Okay, um, and hopefully Alan can connect back or, or call in uh, perhaps to if he can't connect with the internet. 
Um, Sandra, what about you? What what metrics should we be um, measuring and keeping track of in a virtual care environment? I think that you need to use both qualitative and quantitative metrics. And um, um, right now, there is not enough um, information or data, or at least the data that it that is available is not organized. And um, but you know that is is coming. Um, and of course, measure outcomes. It would be it, it would be key. We need to to know how this is uh, this approach is is working in our population. We know that, for example, in the, um, uh, psychiatric care or uh, mental health, uh, um, there is in, there is data that that says that virtual care is is effective. But I don't know in other disciplines yet. And um, and uh, of course, I think that uh, surveying patients regarding their experience, and this is uh, uh, something that even can be done easily because after you log out uh, of uh, a video call, you can uh, ask the patient to do uh, a survey, and that will give us uh, information in terms of the qualitative um, experience or information. Well, as a qualitative researcher, I absolutely agree about the importance <laughs> of collecting that qualitative data. Yes. Um, so next up, I want to bring up sustainability. So one of our uh, fantastic professors in health healthcare management is Dr. Miru Jana. Um, and she, uh, of course, thanks everyone uh, for their time and asks, um, starts with the uptake of virtual care has been significant during the COVID-19 crisis as opposed to pre-crisis, which may have been, and as you already mentioned, facilitated by provincial measurements, uh, measures, sorry, and reimbursement changes. Now, the question is, how sustainable do you think this model is in its current state? And what are, in your opinion, the critical success factors to ensure a smooth transition post COVID-19? Do you have any organizational plans in that regard? So let's go back to Andrew. I know, I know, we can't uh, ask Alan the hard questions. So back to you, Agnes. Can you see me? I can't see, but I can hear you. Oh, maybe I can. I I might not have you pinned. Can other people okay. see? I had to come back on another device. My other device. There. Yeah. He's available. Oh, there you are. I see you. Okay, so um, I think Andrew wants to save this question for you. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Um, were you able to hear the question or do you want me to repeat? Yeah, so it was about plans for sustainability and the smooth yeah. transition. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, we we have, um, we're moving in this direction. We, we've, we've hired, uh, we're advertising actually an executive director who's going to be both ambulatory care and virtual care. Um, it's part of our core strategy. So naming someone who's responsible, we have a medical director uh, to support as well. So I think actually defining a, a leadership role responsible for supporting the transition is, is a critical part. Um, we're also working, you know, to working regionally. I think part of this is not just working inside our own walls, but working across the system to say, how, how will we, how will this work in the future? Um, if, if patients have to be using many different types of technologies to connect on, you know, with different providers, I do think that could be, pose a barrier in the future, um, unless there's a common look and feel at the front end for them. And, and so for us to work uh, with partners like Andrew and other, others around the region to say, how can we make this a seamless, um, a, a seamless view? Uh, so that if you need a specialist at the Queensway, this is what it looks like. If it's a, a specialist at the Ottawa Hospital, this is what it looks like. So there's one platform and, and one, one access in uh, so that at least it doesn't uh, create confusion that way. Um, those would be two big things. I think the third is, and again, this is maybe where we work with um, at a provincial level, looking at for how we can keep those incentives in place. Um, they may need to be addressed and changed. You know, there may be some behaviors that uh, that are not uh, where we're not getting big value from it. And so we need to work with the payer, with the, with the Ministry of Health to say, look, it's in our best interest to, to work on this together. Let's make sure we have a strong incentive system that's aligned with the outcomes you want to achieve, and let's work together on on on, on helping to implement the system and, and monitor towards those outcomes. Um, so that's really those would be three sort of areas that where I would say we've got to keep keep our eye on. 
Great. Andrew, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, just a couple of things. So Matt Anderson, the uh, CEO of Ontario Health, uh, has indicated support for continuing with those physician billing codes. So I think that'll be a, a key enabler. And physicians are seeing real value in this. Like if a patient presented to our emergency department with a head injury and we did a CAT scan of the head and saw blood, we'd send that patient to the Ottawa hospital to see a neurosurgeon who may say, yeah, nothing we can do here. And they'd send them back to us. You know, now we just upload it to a virtual platform. The neurosurgeon will look at the CAT scan sitting in his living you know, wherever he is. And, uh, and uh, say, yeah, no, you don't need to send that person here. Uh, you can look after that. You know, so there's there's so many things that are really improving, you know, the provider experience and the patient experience that I, I think uh, these changes are, a lot of them are here to stay. I, I, I agree that virtual care is here to stay and, um, and, uh, so it would be interesting to also benchmark which other what other promises are doing with uh, virtual care. I think that BC uh, is doing the, is is quite advanced in in terms of billing coding and uh, um, and all those things that are, that are important for com compensation. And the other thing that would be great is to, to have a, a unique chart, right, in which the, the patient can see different clinicians and there is uh, there is no need to log on in different platform. This is something that I would love to see and something similar that the um, NH, NHS, that they, they have a GP at hand that is one platform you connect over, over a phone um, with a with a family physician. I would love to see that. And uh, I don't know, this is maybe something, some of the objectives uh, that uh, virtual care should be, you know, we should be looking forward from now on. Is the, that, and that is going to improve ac accessibility uh, for patients and also for, for clinicians as well. It's going to make the life easier for everybody. And Sandra, if I may follow up with you specifically, from an entrepreneurial lens, what opportunities do you see for um, entrepreneurs in supporting sustainability of virtual care services going forward? So, you know, COVID created, every crisis pro provides an opportunity. And this is when, if you have an entrepreneurial heart, this is when, when things come to you. And um, I think that I am interacting with lots of entrepreneurs that have amazing ideas. Um, the, but the entrepreneurial landscape, I have to say here in, in Canada, is a little bit hard. Um, so it's not as, as easy for an entre entrepreneur here than probably to go and uh, Silicon Valley. The ecosystem for entrepreneurship uh, is not the same. It's not as well prepared. Right now there are things that are starting to move. Uh, but for example, the world of the angel investment in, in, in Canada, uh, only 35% of the angel investment goes to research, development, and technology. The rest, the rest go to a small business. And for an entrepreneur like me, uh, we are aiming first for angel investment. And uh, so, you know, I think that there is lots of opportunities, but uh, we need to have uh, the ecosystem needs to start, needs to be a little bit better prepared is the only thing I can say. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's great insight. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, on to another question. Um, this one is about equity. So um, Melanie Caulfield asks, how have your organizations addressed inequities when clients do not have access to the needed equipment or connectivity to access virtual care? Um, maybe, uh, Alan, we'll start with you since we, you need to go soon. So we got to get, get the value out of you as much as possible now. Yeah, that, that's an ongoing concern. I, I have to say that's probably one area where we need to, uh, dig in a bit. Uh, oftentimes there are other care providers who can support, um, whether they be formal or informal, 
Um, otherwise, uh, you, you know, we're looking for simple technologies like the telephone. Most people have a telephone. Um, um, and in fact, the folks uh, who don't uh, wouldn't often be coming to the hospital anyway. So we need to think of other ways to, to meet their need on top on top of what we're doing. Um, there is also, you know, issues around, um, um, you know, deafness, for example, where there, there, there are certain disabilities where we might be able to do, you know, a better job with the technologies. We can, we can, we can bring in, um, uh, you know, sign language experts uh, to be sort of on the screen at the same time, which actually makes it a little bit more, uh, a, a bit, a bit, bit easier to manage. Um, and 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 also there often is sometimes built in technologies for for changing the language in the, in the communication so you can actually do some things that you wouldn't do otherwise. Um, so I would just say it's multi pronged. I wouldn't say we're there yet. We've got a lot of work to do to ensure that consistency of, of approach. Um, but we have done a couple of things like I talked about the sign language uh, and, and the translation piece, uh, which are, are, are two big ones. Perfect. Uh, Andrew, what about your organization? Yeah, so I would uh, echo Alan's uh, thoughts uh, about we, we can do better on this. Um, Queensway Carlton Hospital serves a large rural population also where some folks simply don't have internet. Um, so we are, in addition to the telephone, we're looking at alternate providers to start uh, providing care. Uh, one such program are community paramedics, uh, where paramedics are actually going to uh, people's homes and doing assessments and then linking up with uh, uh, providers through their own technology. Um, so we're really rethinking which provider delivers which care in which setting. There are also several community partners that deliver very substantial services to, uh, to especially rural uh, areas. So a lot of the community provider organizations already have existing structure to support. Uh, so we're working with them to uh, to ensure access to care for for those folks. But Great. we a lot better. I I confess. Uh, well, that's the first step is acknowledging that I guess. Um, before I move on to Sandra, uh, Alan, did you, we want to say goodbye now? I know you have to go and handle some important things for people in Ottawa. Yeah, I apologize for having to uh, cut out a bit early and I apologize for disrupting the, the proceeding. So again, just thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for the interest in the topic and uh, I look forward to, to future interactions. Uh, so take care and good luck with the rest of the evening. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All, all right, uh, Sandra, on to you. Um, so the, the, issue, the issue of uh, equity is, a, is something that is global, it's a global issue uh, because of the access of um, technology. And there is, um, there is a phenomenon that is called the um, digital divide, right? That we don't want that that happen. It's a phenomenon uh, that is, we don't, we don't want that this happen here in Canada. And uh, of course, one of, of, of the thing is that there is lo I think that there is around 76% of the population here in Canada have a cell phone and a smartphone. And, um, but we have a very large uh, rural population, around uh, 7%, 17 million of Canadians live in rural, <laughs> rural areas. So, um, and sometimes we know that it's not only the access to the internet, it's also the quality. And you need to have a, a good connection. Is the, the speed um, in order to have or the download speed in order to download some of those applications that you will need uh, to have a, an interaction with the with the provider. But it's, it's one of the issues is uh, that technology um, has to address is the equity, and we don't want to get into the digital divide issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I have another question around um, equity, but I got to admit to you first that I, I teach some of our participants in my Healthcare in Canada class, and this question is very similar to one of their assignment questions that they have to write a briefing note on. So it's a little sneaky. I, mean, I can't tell if they're trying to get you to help with their assignment, um, but <laughs> we'll let it in. 
Um, so would you share what unique challenges the pandemic poses in delivering mental health and addiction services? So Andrew, can we start with you? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, this is a highly stigmatized population mm -hmm. that uh, have uh, have a long and chronic history of uh, of uh, inequitable access to uh, health care services. And even the services that are provided are often not or sensitive to, to, to their needs. So even within the healthcare industry, there is a stigmatization of this population. The, um, so th I think this population has suffered more than most uh, as a result of this. And in fact, early in the pandemic, we saw a really dramatic decrease in the number of mental health presentations to our emergency department and the a real decrease in the number of uh, patients admitted. Um, the, uh, so that's some evidence that you know, this population was even further stigmatized. As time has gone on and some of the chronic mental health disorders have just not been taking their medications, they are coming back and getting access to the services. Another issue, uh, in the mental health population in particular is that there are many service providers out there, but the, the care, the service provision is very fragmented, non-coordinated. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's amazing how many things are out there, but nobody talks to each other. Nobody knows what each other's doing. And a lot of these operations shut down early in COVID. Uh, many of them were quite small. Um, so a lot of uh, mental health uh, patients who relied on some sort of community service to keep them well lost access to those types of services. And uh, eventually they end up uh, in the emergency department, which I would suggest is not a very uh, appropriate place to deliver mental health uh, care. Uh, it's just not a good environment for it. And uh, um, so I hope that helped to answer the question. And I didn't give away too much, so. Well, you really highlighted what a complex uh, and important topic that yes. would be for an assignment. So, <laughs> um, yeah, <good>. Sandra. <laughs> Sandra. So, uh, I guess that uh, I I hear that the government of Canada is uh, actually acknowledging that and has made a, a big investment in the, um, uh, mental health. Uh, I think it's two hundred and forty millions that are going to go for virtual virtual care, but you know, one of the issues is accessibility. And we know that uh, in mental health and um, uh, vulnerable population, one of the things is the interdisciplinarity, right? And we know that there is a big percentage of Canadians that don't have access to interdisciplinary teams. And this is, is what, in which virtual care could be something amazing because you can assess a patient uh, simultaneously using remote uh, um, tools, but uh, they might not be benefit for this. And we are not only talking about uh, uh, also pe people that are in jails too could be uh, could benefit for this this kind of care in terms of equity. So. Um, I think that ho hopefully this investment <laughs> is going to be um, is going to be well spent in trying to figure it out how we can support population that is vulnerable and uh, will benefit the most for for virtual care. I think this is such an important topic. Do you mind if I build a little bit on uh, some of these points? By all means, sure. Please. These are uh, one one thing we're seeing is that there's actually an increase in the incidence of uh, mental health diagnosis in the general population. So I mean, these are very uncertain times. We're all quite anxious, um, and you know, people aren't sleeping. Uh, there's there's generally a marked increase in the number of anxiety type uh, disorders that we're seeing. We're also seeing people who have suffered economically terribly. Like mm -hmm. businesses have uh, shut down. You know, the, the sole income earners for for families have lost their jobs, and unfortunately, we've had an increase in the suicide rate in Ottawa over the last uh, uh, several months. Um, and we're seeing more substance, alcohol, and drug abuse uh, in the general population. So, despite the fact that there are limited LCBO hours, we seem to be purchasing far more alcohol than ever before. Uh, you know, and I, I 
that's likely a, a result of folks with anxiety trying to self-medicate. And uh, uh, but that uh, is not a healthy option. I think uh, going for jog or something might work a bit better. Uh, but that's going to have some consequences uh, you know, over the next months to years, actually, uh, physical and uh, emotional. Yeah, very important point. Um, one of my uh, newest studies that I'm launching now is looking at how we provide chronic illness care to individuals with serious mental illness. And we know that we don't do a good job of it. We tend to really mm -hmm. hone in on the serious mental illness and not on their chronic conditions, which they suffer far more from than the average population. I wonder, um, especially maybe Andrew, in the emergency department situation, it, is there any kind of, um, uh, do, does that come into play at all with COVID? Are we treating, um, are we looking at COVID in the the addiction and mental health population differently? Do we do we take their complaints of symptoms as seriously? Has that has that been anything that's shown up? So the um, in most emergency departments um, early in the pandemic, in particular, do we split the the volume of patients into potential COVID and not potential COVID? So we call them green and blue zones, basically. Uh, and mental health would be an independent variable to that. So. Uh, but in general, I would say that there's a there's a tendency in uh, healthcare, in the mental health patient, to attribute a lot of uh, physical symptoms to the underlying mental health disorder. Uh, so someone with a serious uh, issue like schizophrenia, for example, may be describing very significant abdominal pain, and a clinician may well attribute that to um, the underlying psychiatric disorder and not. Uh, the acute appendicitis or whatever is actually causing the abdominal pain. So uh, that's been there all along, actually. And that's a challenge in emergency medicine is, uh, you know, ensuring that there's, um, you know, what would be labeled as a mental health disorder isn't actually an underlying intoxication yes. or some other, uh, some other, some other uh, stroke or something, you know, anything else. So uh, uh, clinicians have to be ever vigilant for that. Sandra, did you want to add? Um, I think that, you know, virtual care could could offer an incredible opportunity to address uh, those issues and uh, hopefully we can see uh, more of these coming. So these people don't have to go to an ER if they don't need and uh, some of these um, uh, disorders of anxiety can be treated uh, using techniques that are not medical, right? Uh, that we all know. And um, it's just from the preven from from the prevention aspect of uh, of mental health. Mm -hmm. So let's um, broaden out a little bit more to the general public. Uh, Mosin, one of our Masters of Science students, asks um, a big issue in delivering virtual care during the pandemic and educating the general population was having trustworthy information, given that there was lack of. Um, Oh, sorry. So a big issue in delivering virtual care during the pandemic and educating the general population was having trustworthy information, given that there was a lack of data at the beginning of the pandemic and a lot of misleading information has been circulating on social media platforms. I think I did an OK job reading that. How did you deal with this issue? Yeah, so I'm interpreting that question to mean all of the misinformation that was available uh, early in the pandemic the conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. I yeah. also, also want to add, uh, maybe I don't know if that was the purpose of the question, but the idea that our evidence was changing as we were learning more. So it's misinformation, but also us having more knowledge over time. OK, absolutely. So I'll address that, that one first. So early in the pandemic, um, there was little understanding of how the virus behaved and information coming from public health was changing uh, quite frequently. In the healthcare field, it had very significant impacts because when uh, the Ontario government uh, declared that COVID was airborne, which means that it can be spread in the ventilation ventilation of the building, or it's and it really changes the requirements for personal protective equipment. So even in healthcare, it was causing uh, some issues. Uh, once uh, the the uh, ministry understood that this is actually a contact spread 
that is, you know, it spreads by coughing or direct contact with droplets. It actually changed the requirements for personal protective equipment. So early on, you heard a lot of talk about N95 use. That's a, a very uh, high level of personal protective equipment. But the truth is that the supply chains internationally are fractured. Uh, N95s come from China. Uh, others come from Italy, and both countries were out of commission very early. Uh, so there's a lot of angst even within the healthcare professionals about uh, the changing information early in the pandemic. Um, you'll see that as we you know, started going into the um, lifting of restrictions, uh, it seems that every jurisdiction had a different uh, approach to it. That's in part caused by uh, the different incidents of COVID in the general population, say Toronto versus Ottawa, uh, but again, causes confusion out there. And then on top of that, there were some deliberate misinformations that were out there that actually caused some fear in the population and generated quite a few emergency department visits uh, because uh, mm -hmm. there's a whole list of symptoms, including diarrhea that they're saying could be from COVID. So. Uh, uh, so we did have a lot of the worried well coming to the emergency department as a result of um, uh, that confusing information that was out there, particularly early in the uh, pandemic. But, you know, I think that this is something that, uh, the, the, despite the fact how disrupted was this, uh, all these issues, is uh, something that we never deal with anything similar in history, right? Okay, except the, the pandemic in, in the 1918 uh, and 1919. But, you know, so obviously every day there was a different uh, information, like Andrew, Andrew said, plus the, the disruption uh, with the supply chain and uh, I, you know, as a, as a patient, um, most of, um, we were really scared to go to the hospital. This is something that um, I hear that uh, physicians, they were receiving patients that should have come earlier and it was the opposite of what you, Andrew, described, right? That they were coming later because they were afraid to to go to the emergency sooner and uh, so you know we all adapted as we could this is uh, this is something that never happened and uh, so ho hopefully we are developing uh, data in our toolkits in order to to prevent you know if something happens there is a second wave or a, uh, you know we we know what to do we learn yeah so Sandra's absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, early in the pandemic, there was uh, a fear that hospitals were dirty places that you get COVID. Uh, so there's a general fear in the population. And in fact, uh, those folks who had medical conditions that really ought to have had medical care would um, would delay and delay and delay and then end up coming in uh, quite a bit worse than had they come in a few days ago, actually. And mm -hmm. that prompted the regional chiefs of staff to send out a communication to the general public at one point saying, look, we're here, we're open, we're clean, we're safe. Uh, if you have a, a concern, you know, a medical concern, please feel safe to come and visit us. Uh, we've never done that kind of thing before. Uh, we saw our volumes <laughs> drop uh, to by about 50% in the first few weeks. Uh, we're up to a well, well into our pre-COVID emergency activity at that at this point. Uh, but those visits that we did see, there were often, you know, people just worried about COVID uh, in part because of the information that was out there actually. So we weren't seeing the heart attacks, the appendicitis, the strokes, you know, the, all those things were staying home. Uh, it was more the anxious types that were mm -hmm. visiting. We didn't imagine that the pandemic would be the solution to long wait times at the emergency department. <laughs> there was one point it was like a 20 minute wait. I've never seen that happen in decades. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Um, I'm going to skip to one of the questions that I had, which is around frontline workers. So how can we support frontline workers during times of rapid change when they too are affected by the pandemic? So in this time, are things like burnout taken into consideration or are we just pushing forward and crossing that bridge when we get there or when the crisis is over? So you want me to, Sandra, do you want to start that one or you want me to? Uh, yes, um, I think that, um, you know, 
provider well-being is one of the pillars of the Ontario health team even, right? So um, we need to, to provide, you know, mental, mental health uh, resources, self-care uh, to the providers besides uh, the equipment, because, you know, at the beginning also there was shortage of um, PPE for for healthcare providers, so I don't think that we we cannot uh, we can we cannot wait until uh, the crisis uh, happened. We need to start being proactive, and and uh, some departments are very proactive regarding you know having uh, resources for uh, healthcare providers to avoid burnout and. Uh, and some others don't. Um, in also some regions, even around the world, there is and uh, we don't. There is not enough healthcare providers. And um, but you know we need to, to to start using imagination because imagination is one of the um, uh, let's see principles of uh, recovering for after a pandemic is how we can we can help. Uh, healthcare providers do not get into uh, anesthesia of burn burnout. So the, this is a huge concern for me, uh, our provider burnout, basically. And, you know, early in the pandemic, we were all terrified. We didn't understand how the virus works. We didn't know what was adequate protective equipment. And we had a great fear that the resources of the healthcare system overwhelmed as it was in Italy, Spain, uh, and many American cities. Uh, so a lot of planning uh, went on to uh, make sure that we provide care in the case that uh, healthcare resources were overwhelmed. And it really led our staff to be working, you know, basically seven days a week, 12 hours a day. They were really at a high, 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 high pace for several months. And many of our staff, uh, frontline and management, started exhibiting signs of burnout. Uh, you know, by about May or so, actually, so not that far into this because of the unsustainable pace of activity. Um, so or, or, so we've identified this as a major uh, risk for our staff and then eventually for our ability to provide uh, good care. Uh, so over the course of the uh, uh, summer, we instituted all sorts of uh, wellness initiatives, including something as simple as take vacation. You know, these guys had no intention. <laughs> And uh, quite frankly, their vacation banks were getting a little crazy high. So uh, we we really uh, enforced uh, the notion that you would take a little bit of time off over the summer. So most of our management, in fact, took three or four weeks off, which, uh, you know, helped. But but we're still not over this thing. I mean, I can see in our staff there's a lack of resilience, uh, their ability to tolerate a little bit of stress. It's almost like we have PTSD at this point. Uh, the uh, so. Uh, so wellness is still a major issue that we're dealing with, and it's very, very important. Uh, in addition, a lot of our frontline providers are young parents that have children at home and with kids going back to school. You know, our providers actually have, uh, you know, the same issues as everyone else with daycare or going to school or uh, all of that sort of thing. So um, we are one of our major um, uh, issues uh, that's preventing us from getting back to pre-COVID elective activity is a lack of nursing staff, actually. So particularly in the operating rooms and, and such, you know, some providers uh, towards the end of career just decide, okay, this is it, I'm done. You know, I don't want to deal with this COVID thing. And others, uh, the younger, are, uh, are having the child care issues. So we we're actually trying to imagine how we're going to uh, run our business with a 30% reduction in staff which is very significant, but uh, we're trying to make plans for that. Uh, so there are a lot of issues. Staff is burning out and uh, you know, staff have to deal with family uh, illnesses and such. So uh, it's really, uh, really impairing our operations. And this touched on one of the questions we had from in our registration, which is the dilemma that uh, providers are faced with when their professional obligation um, it comes at a, a point in time when they have parental obligations. So when the dilemma of needing to to meet those, I don't know, Sandra, if you wanted to comment on that. 
Oof. So I work with women my entire life, right? So uh, most of the of the care providers are are women, and um, so you know this. Um, but I I think that what I am seeing in in women, especially the resilience, that you know is something natural, and despite the fact that there is this dilemma, I think that we choose what we are doing because uh, being a healthcare provider is a vocation, right? So if we you put this in context, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that sometimes you, you have to do what you have to do. And it, not might, it might not be perfect, um, but as an organization, I, uh, it would be great if there is um, support for for those kind of uh, so supporting those kind of dilemmas how how you can uh, implement uh, child, care, child care for those uh, female or or family young families that need to be on call um i think that this this is part of the imagination or reimagination that a pandemic required is sometimes you required to think outside of the box right but um you know, I work with women my entire life, and uh, the main uh, force of in uh, healthcare is, is female. So, I imagine that this poses a, a, a serious, serious problem. Yeah, but you know, using yeah. as I said, uh, reimagination and finding support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is a big, big issue, and and quite frankly. Uh, for most healthcare providers, if their family require them at home, that's where they're going to be. Uh, with my blessing and support, I mean, you do have to look after your family. We've seen quite a few families whose uh, parents were uh, coming to help uh, look after kids while the uh, healthcare provider worked. You know, now the kids are back in school, actually, those parents who are usually in their 70s or 80s are disappearing because they don't want to risk the exposure to COVID because it's quite a bit, uh, it seems to be a lot more serious than the elderly. Um, so we are seeing quite a few providers having to stay home. There are some providers whose uh, specialty, if you will, is so unique that they may be the only one providing it. Um, and in, in that circumstance, most of those providers are, uh, as Sandra said, um, understanding their professional obligations and, and finding alternate arrangements for a family and for home. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, it's, it is a big issue and it is one of the main drivers of our uh, depleted health care force. Thank you for we're that. Hiring. We're hiring, by the way. If oh. <laughs> <laughs> hiring a lot. <laughs> Um, well, just a note uh, that Jim Lambley um, posted a resource in the chat on uh, for frontline workers that have stress related to COVID from the Royal. Uh, I believe he works at the Royal. So uh, sharing that resource on the chat. Thank you for that. Um, that's an, I'm gonna, excellent, that's an excellent resource. That's an yeah. excellent resource. I've seen that actually. So it's really worth a read. Great. So that's in chat if anybody's interested. Um, I'm going to ask one last question from one of our PhD, PhD students, Bahar. Um, she asks, sometimes elderly people cannot access technology or may have difficulty to use technology. How do you address the care and needs of elderly individuals? So it's, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so there is, there is two uh, theories regarding uh, some elderly people are actually better with technology than we think. Right, there is some uh, data there. Um, this is a hard one, <laughs> right? Because if you have to conduct a, a um, visit uh, using technology and video call, and uh, the, 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 the elderly person doesn't have a, a smartphone or doesn't know how to use the, the computer, there is not much resources except doing a, a phone call right mm -hmm. and um it's a, it's a hard one but i guess that um most you know if the, the, the senior is in a in a home he or she can uh, uh, leverage resources uh, that could be available um 
for for that particular uh, patient as well as well as I believe in community health. I think that community health needs to play uh, is is playing and has to play an important important aspect of uh, in in this pandemic. Um, le leveraging public health uh, resources could be one of the answers. I don't know. Maybe Andrew had something more in his toolkit, but. <laughs> Uh, just to build on your point, Sandra, my 85-year-old <laughs> father shows me more about this sort of technology yes. than I so, so he's quite a good instructor for me, actually. But there are a lot of elderly that do not have uh, my dad's engineering brain and, uh, and ability to use technology. Uh, so the strategy we're using is, as you said, uh, partnering with community providers, not just healthcare providers, but um, you know, all sorts of organizations that provide food for elderly. Uh, community paramedic programs. Um, there's there's quite a few providers that are able to get into the home and then do an assessment and then connect with us virtually. Uh, we do have a geriatric day hospital, we call it, which is where we um, try to assist elderly with activities of daily life. Things as simple as opening cans and that kind of thing can be a, a challenge at times. Um, we're actually restarting that virtually uh, this week and uh, so, so a lot of folks are are able to to access the platform, but for those that are not, uh, we're relying on community partners to to help us reach those patients. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so, in my concluding remarks, um, I want to bring up a comment uh, by Dave Nabby. He wrote, "Sadly, we studied the same healthcare accessibility and coordination issues during my MHA 30 years ago." No one wants to kill the silos and the bureaucracy. And the reason I bring that up as closing remarks is that it really rang true to, to much of the research that I do, seeing that the same issues um, that we are experiencing today in healthcare we experienced in the 1970s as well. Um, but Andrew, you said you should never waste a good crisis. And uh, that really stuck with me because I think we didn't. I think we took this opportunity, this very unique and tragic window uh, to create change. And so my hope is that we have sustainability with that. We're able to support innovation and that when this is all over, hopefully soon, um, we'll be able to take our learnings and improve care in a way that we would not have had the opportunity to do so with without such uh, a shakeup to all of our lives and our system. So hopefully we see a lot of positivity emerging um, after this, thanks to all of the hard work. So I want to thank our speakers so very, very much. Uh, Dr. Andrew Falconer and uh, Sandra Matilva, thank you as well as to Alan Forrester. Um, really appreciated your insights um from such a very diverse and interesting perspective so thank you for sharing that with us i know i speak on behalf of all of our audience members when i say it was very valuable and interesting i also want to thank uh, the people that put all of this together um so uh genevieve Segang is behind uh behind all of this hiding and she did a fantastic job with organization and lynn savage on our chat and also to George Langell, who uh, is the brilliant connector uh, that brings together our panelists for events like this. So thank you very much to everyone. I also ask all of our participants to keep an eye out on the for the post event survey, which will come out later today and also for the recording of the presentation in a few days. And I also ask you to keep an eye out for future MHA or Telfer events. Um, that I'm sure other people will will be moderating and I'll be participating and watching. So please keep an eye on those and we'd love to welcome everyone back in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye.